Can technology advance society if it doesn't include all of society? This week, we talked to three disability justice activists who have ideas about how tech can ensure design, technology, and art are accessible and equitable. Not just ideas, they're doing it. And they are sparking a movement. This is The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. For the benefit of our viewers who are blind or visually impaired, we are including audio description to introduce the program's key visual elements. Today, the Laura Flanders program features dancer, choreographer, and technologist Laurel Lawson, data and social fellow Chansey Fleet, and social worker and founder of Ramp Your Voice, Melissa Thompson. Footage illustrates scenes from the National Council on Independent Living Conference in Washington, D.C. People march outside the White House holding signs. A woman wearing rain gear holds up a nickel sign. Host Laura Flanders has a discussion with two activists on the board of nickel. Footage illustrates the disability artwork of Laurel Lawson and Alice Shepard. They are speeding down a ramp while twirling around each other in wheelchairs. Image. On a wooden ramp, Laura Lawson wheels uphill, coming nose to nose with Alice Shepard, who is coming downhill on her knees. Image. Laura Lawson, seated in her wheelchair, looks over her right shoulder as she is seconds away from launching off the end of a ramp. Image. Laura Lawson rests in a wheelchair, her body curled around the frame of her chair. Image. Laurel balances in a side tilt, holding a petite woman on her lap both smiling. Two dancers wrap around them on the floor. Footage illustrates Laurel and Alice intertwining their arms together while spinning around each other in wheelchairs. Does design have politics? Can it advance equality? What about liberation for everyone? As regular viewers of this program know, we've been digging down into questions of disability justice and design and technology. And as we've been doing so, it's been brought to our attention just how debates about things that used to be narrow, like access, are being blown open by disabled activists, artists, and hackers into fully-fledged reimaginings of the world. From software coding to wheelchair repair to art and architectural design and engineering, our environment is not heaven sent. It's constructed and could be very different and way more interesting and fair. No surprise, those with the most at stake are at the forefront of all of this. Among them are today's guests. Laurel Lawson, who is a dancer who we saw recently on the show in performance with Alice Shepard. Laurel is one third of Kinetic Light and co-founder and chief technology officer at the engineering consultancy Psychor Systems. Chancy Fleet, another return guest, is a data and society fellow who coordinates technology education programs at the New York Public Library. And joining us via Skype, Melissa Thompson, who made a star appearance last year in our report on NICL, the National Council on Independent Living. She's a social worker and disability justice activist and the person behind the hashtag disability Too white and the group Ramp Your Voice. So welcome all. I have to say, well, let's start at the very beginning. Does design have politics? Who wants to take a bash at that? Chancy, it sounds like up your street. It does. Every time I use a technology, I am acutely aware of whether people like me, people who are blind, were considered in the design. It's often evident whether we were present in the design. So for example, I use an iPhone. It's pretty accessible. We were definitely considered in the design of the screen reader that enables me to move around and read things on the screen and send things to my braille display. But I don't think that we were very present in the design because I can't speed Siri up to the 700 words a minute that I know how to read using audio. And I have to perform, if I get one of the new iPhones, I have to perform facial attention, and uh, which is not my strong suit. So, Every time I pick up a piece of technology or teach it to a library patron, 
I'm acutely aware of where we were or where we weren't in the in the conversations and, and development steps in the design process. And what about you, Valissa? How do you think about design and politics? I think that for me, I'm thinking about next year being the 30th anniversary of the ADA and how the Americans with Disabilities Act. Yes. And how many buildings are still ADA not compliant? You know, so for me as a wheelchair user, thinking of the structural barriers to that and also how we're using, you know, technology to bring that to the light. So the activism on the ground, so to speak, in you know, trying to get attention to us not being able to go into certain buildings. I know that in my small town, I cannot go to the post office because the post office is in an inaccessible building. So just things of that nature. When you think about design and access, who's thought of? how quickly or not quickly people are willing to ensure that everybody's included and being involved in the community and how we're advocating for ourselves to make those changes. So we have technical design, we have architectural design. How about you in design, Laurel? Everything is political. Technology is deeply political. Design is political. Who is there? Who's getting funded? What is being funded? Who is seen to have agency in the process? As an engineer artist, as a disabled engineer artist, I'm at a very unique place in this web of goings on. And who has agency? Who is presumed to have agency? Who is included? The difference between access, inclusion, and equity is radical. And my practice comes from a place of beginning with radical equity. So an easy way to think about it, if you think diversity is having people in the room, mm -hmm. inclusion perhaps could be thought of as making sure that they can participate, that there is physical access, there is sensory access, there is financial access, racial, gender, that you're beginning to attend to making sure those people can participate. But then what does it mean to be equitable? What, what is it like if everyone in that room is assumed to be equally competent, equally a part of the process? All right, so to give an example, we're looking at some of the images of your work, Kinetic Light, you and Alice Shepard and your colleagues. What, may, what was your approach to making those performances accessible and equitable and equal in the way that you just described? From, a, from the artist standpoint, Kinetic Light is a collective of all disabled artists. So we are coming from that place. When we think about the performances, we are thinking about our community. We're thinking about that experience from beginning to end, how do people hear about it? How do people purchase a ticket? How do people come into the space? And is that experience just as rich and powerful for someone who is blind, is in a wheelchair, is deaf, is non-disabled, has a cognitive impairment? All of these things matter and they all are details that have to be thought about. F during the performance, for example, one of our technological innovations is called Automance. This is a new kind of audio description that came about because our audiences, our communities, our friends, told us that the state of the art wasn't good enough. We're going to talk more about the state of the art because we provided audio descriptions for both the episode that Velissa was in around Nickel and the episode that Alice Shepard and de facto you were in in absentia uh, around Kinetic Light's work. And I'd have to say I found the audio descriptions adequate, I guess, <laughs> but not really sufficient to communicate what we were discussing. And I'll just play an example, and I'd love to get uh, Chansey's take on this, and Velissa and will come back to you in a second. But here's what preceded, understand, 
how this works. It precedes the video. Um, you hear this. For the benefit of our viewers who are blind or visually impaired, we are including audio description to introduce the program's key visual elements. Today, the Laura Flanders program features two choreographers, Alice Shepard, founder, Kinetic Light, and Elizabeth Streb, founder, SLAM, Streb Lab for Action Mechanics. Footage illustrates the disability arts work of Alice Shepard, artist, activist, academic. Shepard whirls gracefully in her wheelchair. She performs with other dancers. They speed down ramps in their wheelchairs, partner in intimate poses, and soar through the air. In archival footage, Laura Flanders' father appears on stage, sitting in his wheelchair. A photo shows the vessel, a tall honeycomb-style structure with connected staircases. So how do they do, Laurel? Am I being too hard? Well, if you were to hear that, and because you are sighted, you were then to see the video that's being described, would you account that to be an equal experience? Uh-uh. Right. So we had to do something, we had to do something better. So we began with the presence and leadership of uh, blind and visually impaired artists, audience members, technologists. Uh, we began exploring ways to make an experience that is just as accurate, as complex, and as artistically rich as what you might experience visually. All right, so I'll come back and find out more about what you did in just a second. But Chancey, this whole area of making all sorts of things accessible is what you deal with <laughs> yes. every day in the library. Uh, what's the state of things as they are? And again, I feel that these descriptions were, I'm happy the people at GBH offer it and I give them thanks for the work they did, but it wasn't simple. It wasn't not costly, it was costly. And it seemed not altogether effective. So the state of things right now, I just, I, I, I'm constantly ricocheting between just being irritated with friction and being so joyful because we don't have baseline access to lots of visual representations of things that could and should be rendered in a non-visual way. And that's kind of what my work at the library is all about. Um, maybe I'll get to talk more about that Please later. Do. But with regard to description specifically, for independent media, for smaller productions, there isn't really baseline access to description. And when we do have description, what you've picked up on is that it was very workmanlike. It was very objective. And when you're experiencing dance, when you're experiencing art, I don't think that you want something so anodyne. I think that you want to connect. And a lot of my work this year at my fellowship has been focusing on the value of subjectivity and the value of thoughtful vocabulary when we think about description and when we think about visual interpretation, I wanna shout out Udescribe, which is a free tool that you can use to describe any YouTube video. And the reason that I wanna shout that out is that more than one person can do a description for the same video. There's also an app called Be Specular that does the same thing with your own photos. You get five or six descriptions from random, mostly helpful, uh, mostly strangers. Um, and both of these tools really underscore that what each person perceives visually is different and that to build your own sense of meaning and priority, often it's helpful to have this like gestalt from the community. And I know that we can't all have that all the time. And I'd rather have basic, concise, workmanlike description than no description. But what I most rather have is the flexibility to to engage on my own terms with content. Velissa, to you, the feminist magazine Catalyst recently issued a special edition on what they were calling Crip Technoscience, and you contributed an essay uh, in which you said that technology, I think the word you used was, is dragging the disability justice movement into the 21st century. Um, what did you mean? Well, I think that particularly over, the, over this decade, we've seen an influx of diverse disabled voices, particularly those of color, those who are LGBTQ+, and everything of that nature. So I really feel that technology is allowing the disabled community to finally begin to look like what its community has always been, which is not just white male faces and voices. 
And for me, technology is giving many of us an equal platform, equal ability to tell our story in our way and not rely and push back on the tropes that have been defining what who we are and what we are as a community and culture, and to really give us each an opportunity to share our individualized experiences so that we can find that community and do a lot of community building. So yes, technology has done a great way of forcing us to be inclusive of each other, to call out some of the isms and phobias that exist in this community, and to allow everybody to be seen and validated for their experience. Explain what you do at Ramp Your Voice, because um, you're really talking about access limitations in people's brains. When I created Ramp Your Voice in 2013, that was my way of creating a space for myself as a black civil woman, as a social worker, and someone who had opinions on different type of topics. And at that time, there weren't many people that looked like me. And now, luckily, six years later, there are. So I really feel that the use of technology through blogging, blogging, and so forth is crushing some of those barriers. We still have a long way to go. But use technology in this way for us to, like I said, build that community, express ourselves, show our you know, talents and gifts, you know, it just really allows us to be empowered and to really just have something that other activists, particularly those who may be older, did not have before. Because you can make yourself heard even if you can't get up those stairs to the meeting. Yes, and be able to advocate for that. You know, if there is an issue that's going on, you can say, hey, you know, I've been discriminated against by this organization, by this company. You know, can you signal boost? Because, you know, with using technology, many companies and businesses have to have a social media page. And no one likes bad publicity, particularly if it goes viral or a lot of attention regardless of the platform. So it's a great way for us to utilize these platforms to get our reach out, to create a more equal and inclusive society. And, you know, I think that's been one of the powerful ways. I know that I've done that myself. Um, two years ago, a major airline lost my wheelchair and I got a very immediate response to get my wheelchair back and also bring attention to this common issue that those who use mobility aids, like wheelchairs, crutches, et cetera, deal with that the average person may not be aware of. Yeah, so coming back to you, Chancey, um, I'm hearing lots of things, very practical things, but I'm also hearing a sort of building of power and the agency of people with disabilities doing a bunch of this work. Um, at the library, you were gonna tell us a little bit more about what you're involved in. So I co-founded what we called the Technology Support Clinic back in 2010 as a volunteer, we approached the library and said, hey, look, as disability activists, we teach each other how to do things with technology all the time because our friends and our family members and our colleagues who are using these tools normatively have like no clue. They want to support us, but they have no clue how assistive technology works. We're helping each other, but we want to reach people who are maybe new to blindness or new to disability and people who aren't really looped in and connected to the community in the same way that we are as activists. Can we make some space for that? And the library welcomed us and eventually I was able to come on board full time with two other former volunteers. We've got Nefertiti Matos and Dario Baiza. Uh, Dario just joined us a month ago. And it's, I think, uh, a really simple but radical prem premise that disabled people should be teaching disabled people the way that we do things. Um, as Liz Jackson said in her uh, New York Times op-ed uh, a year or so ago, disabled people are the original life hackers. We are great problem solvers and the impact of the problems that we've been able to solve is amplified when we can come together in community and, and share those. The latest work that we've been doing, the Dimensions Project, takes this kind of same ethos and applies it to tactile graphics and 3D models. When I was growing up, and I think for a lot of us, when we got access to tactile graphics, raised line drawings, images, they were usually in textbooks and they were always handed to us by a sighted person and kind of uh, that whole production process would determine what images we saw, what the characteristics of those representations were, how long we got to keep them and everything. And I want blind people to be able to be curious about something and look at it like anyone. So we have a little graphics lab, we have a tactile graphics embosser, we have a 3D printer, and we're teaching blind people and sighted allies to come in, bring in images and create uh, accessible 
mm. representations of anything. And Laurel, what you came up with at the end of the day for your show uh, uh, for Kinetic Light um, stuck with me as an idea, although I didn't experience it myself, because the way that you described it, I guess we think of accessibility as making things simple. And the way that you described it was, no, let's complicate in the way that life and, and, and perception is complicated. And that's really what you did, sort of. <laughs> in a way, you, thinking about accessibility, there isn't a single pathway. One person's accessibility is not another person's accessibility. And understanding from a disability first perspective is about those relationships, about that process of bringing people together. As a user uh, interface architect, that is something that we know in a very technical way. We understand research. We understand going to the people who are actually using the product. But disability brings that knowing into an embodied community place. Disabled people make fantastic technologists and designers. We were the original hackers. Disability is about being creative and about problem solving. It's also in many ways, reading and thinking about all this caused me to think a lot about some of what we hold up as values for humanity. Independence, productivity, mm -hmm. stand on your own two feet, be a productive member of society. You throw all that out and say, wait a minute, what kind of values are those, really? At least they should be optional. Who's really independent? Would any of us be here in Manhattan without hundreds of thousands, millions of people doing things so that we can be on this little island? Talk about on a TV set. Vilissa, how do you think about this stuff? Because I'm now getting, if you can see, to these questions of how is the work that is happening in the area of disability justice kind of rehacking and reimagining our world for everybody? Well, I think it's getting people to, from what I see, understand disability in a way that they haven't before. And one way that I've noticed is getting people who have disabilities to embrace and a disabled identity. Yes. Um, this is particularly so from the people of color communities that I'm involved in, particularly. Um, nerd spaces to where black nerds particularly are embracing their different disabilities, particularly if they have invisible, non apparent disabilities and mental illness. So I think that, you know, just allow people to really shed the misconceptions about an identity and really see themselves as being a part of this community and not just harp on the negative, but really seeing that this is an important identity and just important identity as anything else that they may identify as. And to reduce the stigma and shame that can surround disability, particularly for certain communities that may have may have that. And kind of piggybacking off of the whole independent thing, you know, we're all interdependent. We all depend on each other. And I think that community building, as I mentioned before, is very instrumental in getting people to see that I am a part of the community. This is a powerful community. This community has culture. This community has nuance. You know, and that's okay. And to also allow people outside of the community to realize that we need to pay more attention about how we allow people to navigate the world, how we look at people who are different from us, and what can we do to be better co-conspirators or accomplices in crushing some of the isms that exist. Well, Chancey, I've heard word has it that Google is coming up with all sorts of technology, Microsoft as well. Microsoft boasts of having at the top of its design team um, I think a deaf person with an mm -hmm. entirely deaf team, a woman, is that right? Yeah, Jenny LaFleur. Do you have hope of all of from hope? Are you optimistic about all this? I, I'm in a mixed state about all of it. So I am tremendously happy with the shift that Microsoft has made in recent years towards having an accessibility presence that's really upfront and engages directly with users. They've made a lot of great strides with their culture in, in learning from users, in hiring people with disabilities. But all of the big tech companies have uneven accessibility performance. I'm not gonna call anybody out because it would be unfair because anybody could be called out. 
you can't find a large tech company that doesn't have at least one core offering that is broken for accessibility at any given time. And so I have to walk this tightrope between being grateful for, to the workers for doing the work that has been done, but being insistent that the work is not finished and, mm. and probably won't be close to finished for years. 30 seconds from you, Laurel. This is kind of funny, actually, because this gets to a talk I'm going to be giving next week on tech ethics. <sighs> we have such an issue right now, and everyone in tech is aware of it, that the point of danger we are in with private companies controlling so much of the devices the platforms, the spaces. We are dependent on those. So there are ways to address it. There is movement from within and without, but this is a point that we have to be really careful and we have to act. Thank you, all three. It's really been a great experience for is me it? having you here. We will do more of this conversation. Chansey, Laurel, Velissa. Thank you very much. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show, and you can find all the prior experiences of our guests on this program at our website. Thanks.